Uh, yeah, I think that I think comedy is important. You know, beyond the whole like, you know, speaking truth to power and holding up a mirror to society and blah blah blah. You know, uh, I think it's just important to laugh. You know. All right, Lou. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Artie. I figured to start, I'd read a little paragraph of of your book. So in chapter 19, you write, that's one of the side effects of mixing politics and comedy. It allows people who aren't funny to think they're closer to comedians because they know a little something about politics. They can even invite one onto their podcast to show them just how much they know. So welcome to Thoughtfully Mindless. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Just so everyone knows, that that was about Artie. Um, (laughs) I hadn't met Artie yet. But I had a premonition that, you know, a couple of years later, I'd be talking to him and I'm like, you know, no, it, it was a, it, it was about some other guy. Yeah. So, yeah, no, we're, uh, you know, I was reading this in preparation for the interview. <laughs> I just came across that and laughed. Uh, so you are, you're a producer, a writer, a comedian. You are the head writer and producer of the Webby Award winning uh, comedy channel. We are the Internet and you're the host of the Lou Perez podcast. Is there anything you'd want listeners who aren't familiar with your work to know about you aside from that? Um, I, uh, I produce a series with Free the People called Comedy is Murder, which is a sketch comedy series. And we have uh, 10 videos so far that are out and we're going to be making uh, a batch of new ones too. So I'm, I'm excited. I, I've always been a big fan of uh, Matt Kibbe and uh, you know, getting to work with him and, and, his, uh, and his crew, Matt Pataglia, Matt Antonucci. Uh, it's been great. Awesome. Awesome. There's a lot of mats. If, if anyone who doesn't know, <laughs> this might, this might be a little too inside baseball, but free the people's got a lot of mats. So. <laughs> I feel like it's one of the, it's definitely one of the more common names. I feel like I've ran into some groups where you just end up with a bunch of mats. So. I have a brother, Matt, and then I have a son named Matteo. So I'm, <laughs> I'm no help. I'm definitely not changing the game. Yeah. So I read your book, uh, that joke isn't funny anymore. Amazing book. I laughed my ass off during the during reading it. It's it's insightful. Like it goes into politics quite a bit, but it it also has a lot of jokes in there. Um, so, <laughs> some jokes that uh, pretty risque, but I love it. I I thought it was hilarious, and I feel like I'm in alignment with you. I feel like comedy is sacred. It should be one of those things that. Comedians are allowed to say the things that nobody else is able to say, but we're not in that time anymore. And I feel like that's why you wrote the book. So I'd love to know, first of all, what inspired you to become a comedian in the first place? Yeah. Uh, well, for one, uh, thank you so much for, you know, for reading it and, um, you know, your, uh, compliments I take, uh, very much to heart. So I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to hear you were, you were laughing during the, uh, during the read. Um, when I, yeah, I wonder, you know, what made me go the, the comedy route. Uh, I guess when, you know, when I was a little kid, I was, I was always a funny one in class. You know, I was kind of like a, a class clown with really good grades. Um, so I could like, you know, back up whatever, you know, jokes and stuff I, w- I was making, I guess, by, uh, um, you know, having the grades, um, the grades there. So there's always been, a, I think, a part of me that always wanted to be, uh, wanted to do comedy. I grew up loving like George Carlin and, uh, you know, in the the eighties and nineties comedy was just like all over the place. Yeah. It was everywhere on TV, stand up comedy, sitcoms, movies, you know, comedy was just, uh, was just King. So as much as I thought, Oh, I would love to do something like that. I didn't think it was possible. It's like, you know, it's sort of like, uh, it's almost like, you know, a fantasy of a kid, you know, reading a comic book and being like, Oh, I want to be a superhero one day. I want to be Superman. It's like, man, well, no, no kid that that's impossible. What those guys are doing are, is something that is, you know, superhuman. Um, and then, uh, when I got to, when I got to college, I, uh, decided, uh, that, Oh, I want to try improv comedy. And I saw a, uh, a flyer about a group, uh, a practice group for improv and I'd never done it before. And I went to the first kind of like practice rehearsal without ever, you know, having, having done it. And, uh, I had a good time and I, I skipped the next one and I didn't. And then afterwards, the guy who was running, who was running, it was like, called me up. He's like, Hey, why, you know, we missed you. Like, you know, why didn't you, you come back? And, 
in a way, I wonder if that's what I needed, you know, because I maybe I could have done it once and then I would have just, you know, just, you know, let it go. Um, yeah. But the fact that like someone was like, oh, you were, you know, we really enjoy, you know, playing with you and we thought you were, you know, really good and let's keep doing this. And that kind of, you know, started things. So what, 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 what started as kind of like a hobby in college, uh, you know, suddenly you're, you know, getting up on stage in front of an actual audience and it's like, oh, wow, this is, uh, you know, maybe there, there's something here. Yeah, it's funny how those little moments of encouragement can mm. go a long way. Because like, anytime you're putting yourself out there, I mean, we tend to be our worst critics. So it's like, you know, you, it, it's it's really hard to perceive how you're being perceived, I think. Yeah, it, it can be. And um, I have a habit, I don't know if, if, if uh, you or any of your listeners are like this, where I sometimes catastrophize hmm. and think the worst, the worst thoughts. So, uh, you know, there's been moments where, especially if I, if I haven't heard from somebody in a while, I figure, oh, they must be mad at me or something, or maybe they, maybe they, they have, they are actively staying out of my life because of, uh, something I did. And most of the time, more than most of the time, it's just not the case. It's just, uh, you know, we all have lives with a lot going on, uh, yeah. in it, but, uh, but no, that, that, that encouragement really goes a long way. You know, like I said earlier, like, you know, uh, your kind words about my book like that, that feels great to hear that. Yeah. It's like, okay, this makes sense. There's a, <laughs> there's a reason why, you know, I spent, you know, however many months, you know, writing, uh, you know, writing this thing and, uh, you know, re-editing, you know, rewrite it, and rewrites and rewrites and rewrites, you know, yeah. to, to get that kind of a compliment. So. I have to laugh at the catastrophizing because I do the same thing. Like I'll, I'll leave a social situation. I'll be like, Oh, I pissed those people off. Mm. And then I'll like retouch, like I'll touch base with them later. And, and they're like, what are you talking about? Like you didn't irritate anybody. Like I'll just get in my own way, get in my head. And same thing. If I don't hear from somebody for a while, I'm like, Oh, they're probably mad at me. And that's, yeah. yeah, yeah my, my, just busy. Yeah. And I have a problem where I'm, I, I could be a real pain in the ass. And, um, Sometimes that same like catastrophize, like thinking the worst can also put me in situations where I think I'm in the right. And yeah. if I'm in the right, I'm going to fight for it, man. Yeah. I'm going to fight so hard because I am in the right. And then it, and it's like, no, dude, you're being an asshole. <laughs> and I look back and I'm like, oh man, I, I, I really fucked that. You know, I could have fucked that up. Like that yeah. was, uh, that was a, there, there were a couple of times in, in my, in my career and I, I won't name like specifics of like, you know, who, uh, who the company was or anything. But there were times when I, when I had written, I remember one time in particular, a while back, I wrote this email that was basically saying, I, I, ref I, I will never work with you or your company again. You have, you know, spit in my face and, and you don't respect my, what I bring to the table and my artistic vision and blah, blah, blah. You know, like I wrote this long screed. Yeah. And fortunately I slept on it because had I sent that, it would have derailed my career. <laughs> like for one, it was like, it was like, no, you shouldn't send that anyway. Uh, you're, you're wrong. Uh, and, uh, you know, just thinking about, man, if had I messed up and, and, and sent that email, I think, you know, maybe I wouldn't be talking to you today. Yeah. Party. Maybe it would, who knows where I, where I would be. So yeah, I think something that I've, I've, uh, need to do more of is like take a breath step back yeah. and, and yeah. look in the mirror and be like is it me because it could be me yeah i could be the i could be the problem in this situation you know sometimes we are the problem <laughs> yeah you know it's like sometimes you know there's a, a common denominator in, in these situations <laughs> you know it's like a girl yeah. who who's like man all every guy i date is shitty it's like yeah it might might be you, you know, you might, yeah. might the, except the, I'm the one, you know, I'm, I'm, I could, I could sometimes be the, uh, the shitty guy, I guess. Yeah. Hey guys, I'll do that too. Like every girl I date is crazy. And it's like, mm, there might be a common denominator there. Mm -hmm. for sure. <laughs> right. So you mentioned George Carlin. Uh, I love George Carlin and you mentioned Norm Macdonald in your book and Norm is like, when I look, think about my Mount Rushmore of comedy, like Norm is like number one for me. I, I've always loved his humor. Uh, do you have a Mount Rushmore? Like who are your Mount Rushmore is four people, right? Yeah. Who are your four that you'd put there? If I was going to take over native land and carve <laughs> faces of comedians yeah. into a mountain, 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think Carlin, uh, probably, you know, Carlin prior, um, I think, yeah, Norm would probably have to be up there. I, I, uh, one of the things I, I, there's kind of like a, a running joke with, um, friends of mine and, and my wife too, where, uh, I never watched the Sopranos when the Sopranos was on. Yeah. And I ended up watching it like 10 years later and I'm watching it 10 years later and like, like texting my friend, like, Oh my God, the show is amazing. He's like, yeah, man, it's the Sopranos. And it yeah. ended 10 years ago. And how are you just seeing this now? So I, uh, the same thing with music, like uh, there's like music that I'll find I'm like, Oh my God, this song's so good. It's like, yeah, it came out 20 years ago, man. Like, like, you know, you had a lot more hair. Your hairline was a lot, in a lot better position when the, this thing first came out. Um, but, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of often like late to the game. And I think with, with Norm McDonald, McDonald, I, I didn't, I didn't realize how great he was until, uh, probably, uh, probably the last few years of his, of his life. Mm-hmm. Um, and when, uh, I don't know if it was, uh, I don't know if it had to do with kind of, maybe there wasn't as much great comedy coming out where, mm-hmm where what became so comforting is just going, being able to go back on YouTube and just watch these old clips of Norm Macdonald on, on like Conan, you know, especially. And, you know, just, you know, just watch it. Like people were doing a lot of clips from, uh, from his own show, the, the interview show they had on like Netflix and stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, you know, yeah, he, he's one of those, one of those greats that I didn't realize how great he was until, you know, we were close to losing him and then, and then, you know, we, we eventually uh, lost him. Um, but yeah, so he, he's definitely made his, uh, I'm, I'm carving him onto a, you know, onto a, onto a mountain. So one of my favorite can- Canadians. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's amazing. I, his ability to just draw people into this long winded joke that wouldn't be funny without the long windedness is just amazing. And the way he would kind of troll late night hosts like Conan O'Brien and that, not troll, but it, uh, it felt like trolling a bit. He would troll the audience, troll the, troll the host a bit. Yeah. And he would just draw you into this almost stupid story, but it would have this punchline that, like I said, it wouldn't be as funny without <laughs> the long windedness, but it, I just well, love this delivery. Yeah. 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 And I'm, I'm glad you said delivery too, because, um, you know, so much of comedy is, is, de- is delivery. And, I don't think someone would look at Norm Macdonald and be like, oh, he has like a quintessential comedian's delivery, you know, yeah. like set up, you know, punchline, everything's smooth. No, there's a lot of stutters and ah uh, and ums and stuff, but there, it, it, it all, not only does it work, I mean, it's, it's absolutely brilliant, you know, so, um, yeah. he's, you know, I mean, very much a, you know, a one of a kind. Um, uh, another Canadian I'd love to give some, some love to is, uh, Scott Thompson hmm. from, uh, the kids in the hall. And, um, Scott, I'm very, uh, fortunate to be able to call a friend. Uh, so we've, we've you know, been friends for the past uh, few years and, um, he came through town, um, a little while back, I, I guess, yeah, it was over the winter for his one man show called King, where he does his character, Buddy Cole. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Scott Thompson, the kids in the hall, go watch Buddy Cole clips on YouTube, uh, Buddy Cole is like a super flaming uh, gay guy with an ascot and stuff. And he's it's completely hilarious. And um, so my wife and I, we went to go go see the Buddy Cole show. And I shit you not, I haven't laughed that hard in years. Like, I don't remember the last time I laughed that hard. And... Um, he made us laugh so hard that my wife lost her voice. <laughs> so for like an hour, I think it was like an hour and 20 or something like that. Laugh. Like my, my wife laughed so hard that she lost her voice. And we got, we, we, we met, uh, we met up with, uh, with Scott and, uh, normally my wife has a very, fe- you know, like kind of feminine voice, but she lost her voice. So it was like this like raspy thing. So Scott Thompson, has never heard my wife's real voice because <laughs> he ruined her voice for, I think it was like a week or so. Yeah. That's how, that's how much he, he killed. Uh, so I would have to put, 
there's going to be two Canadians on on the uh, my Mount Rushmore's Scott Thompson, Norm Macdonald, uh, George Carlin, and Richard Pryor. So I think that I mean I think that would be yeah, having the four of them in a room would be pretty fucking amazing. Yeah, and if you're going to steal native land, you got to put a foreigner on there too, right? I mean, it fits. Who, what do you got to put around there? Sorry. If, you, if you're going to steal native land, you got to put a foreigner on there too. Oh, yeah. Oh, totally, totally. Makes sense. So. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, yeah, the only foreigners I'm comfortable with are Canadians. Those are the... Uh... <laughs> so in, in your book, you mentioned that like your political comedy wasn't it wasn't intentional. Like it wasn't like planned to go that way. It's just kind of the way things ended up. How did, how did that play out exactly? Yeah. So with, um, with we, the internet TV, um, they were, you know, putting together this program where they wanted to do political satire. And it was sort of an opportunity there, like my kind of first opportunity to bring together my years of sketch comedy experience with, you know, my libertarian point of view and that, you know, bringing those together and being able to build an audience on it, you know, was a way it's like, Oh, cool. We're going to, we're going to keep doing this. Uh, so, uh, what was it like? I think like five years or so I was, uh, you know, making stuff, uh, producing stuff with them, which ended in, in October of 2020. Um, so yeah, we sort of, you know, kind of, you know, went that route. And I, on my, on my podcast a while back, I had Ryan Long on, uh, who's another Canadian and one of my, yeah. one of my top, uh, one of my, I love, I love Canadians. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd asked Ryan about, because Ryan does a lot of political, you know, satire, cultural satire yeah. too. Yeah. And I brought up the, I, you know, it's like, give a wor- worry about getting like kind of pigeonholed or, um, and he, he made a really good point. It's like, you know, comedy, when you're commenting on the culture, it is, this is what you're commenting on. Like if this is what's going on in politics and you're commenting on what's going on in politics, if this is what's going on in the culture. You're, this is your material that you're working with. So it's like not even to worry about like, Oh man, am I just doing political stuff about what, you know, uh, and just kind of go with it and go where the, uh, the jokes are and go where the, um, you know, the, your original ideas are. Yeah. Like today, cause I know this, this is coming out later in the month. Let's see if I, if, I don't know if I'll film it. All right, I'll try to film it. Uh, so there's like, there's been this silly discourse on, on, on X that I've seen in response to vice president, presidential candidate, Tim Walls, uh, apparently, you know, had enacted legislation that put tampons in, in, in boys bathrooms. Right. Yeah. So then people were calling them tampon Tim. Uh, uh, and, um, which I, you know, I had a joke. I was saying um, the, the real stolen valor is him taking my uh, nickname from high school. Tampon was my nickname. <laughs> um, but um, I'm seeing like this, you know, this discourse and this woman, one, this woman uh, came out and said um, a young, you know, a young man would basically make so many female friends and be the, and be a good person if he carried around tampons with him, mm-hmm. just in case his classmates, you know, needed them. And she was legit. Like she wasn't a, she wasn't yeah. someone trolling. And the amount of like people I know who are like, no, that guy would, that kid would be the weirdest fucking kid. He would <laughs> creep every girl out. Um, so basically what I want to, uh, what I want to shoot today is a, uh, you know, what is that kid like as a, as a grown up? You no, know, like what if I was the kid back in high school, middle school, carried tampons around and knew all the girls cycles and, you know, and now here I am at age 42, you know, we'll see what happens. So yeah. it's an example of like, is it a real political thing? Well, I guess it started as a political thing because, you know, it's like commentary on, on legislation, but then where it went, you know, you know, what does it say culturally? <laughs> you know? yeah. And then also just like the fun of thinking about, yeah, what, what if that was a real person? Like, what would that, you know, what would that be like? Let's play, let's play with that. And I think that's, that's, you know, part of the fun of, of, of comedy. Yeah. What comes to my mind is how that tampon distributor got started. Like I can just see him kind of being shady in the hall, like tampon, 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 you know, <laughs> like yeah, oh, asking people if they want a tampon instead of drugs, it's tampons, yeah. just trying to or find like, out what everyone's cycle is. You, c- yeah. you got to get started. You don't know. You have to figure them out over time. Right. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. And he knows like when the girls are ovulating, 
which is what, you know, which is, which is a very, which is a lot of information uh, for a young man to have at his yeah. disposal. Yeah. 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 In high school, most of the guys I knew didn't want to talk about periods, let alone carry around tampons and distribute The girls didn't want to talk about periods. <laughs> yeah. Like they're yeah. these poor girls, you know, they're freaking like, you know, their bodies are going through all these, you know, insane changes. Yeah. Uh, and then having to deal with that, you know, um, but yeah, that, uh, just in general though, I mean, you know, tampons and maxi pads and all that, and a boy's bathroom is such a bad idea because boys are just going to use them to goof off. You know, um, yeah. I have a friend of mine, her, one of her, one of her kids is still in high school and they're like, yep, there's like pads stuck all over lockers and stuff. And it's like, Oh, I wonder, wonder why. Yeah. You know, Cause boys are boys. Boys are boys. Yeah. We did use tampons. I was a wrestler. So when we got, I guess our coach would buy tampons for bloody noses. If you got to, mm. you know, because they're ultra absorbent, you know, they work would you, well. um, what, uh, what kind of wrestling did you do? And, and what, what weight class did you wrestle at? Oh, my senior year. So collegiate wrestling, uh, my high school senior year, I wrestled at way too low of a weight. I went to 125. I started at 150 and like lost all the weight. Wow. And I was useless. I, I had no energy by the time the matches come. So I'd like, <laughs> if I can pin them in 30 seconds, great, because I was strong for my size. Mm -hmm. After that, it's like, eh, they're probably going to win if I last, you know, if they can keep me going for more than 30 seconds. Yeah. So. Well, uh, and, and you wrestled in college? No, no, oh. just no, no college. I did. I helped coach a little bit, um, like just helped other athletes in high school after I graduated. But I wasn't a great wrestler. I just, mm -hmm. yeah, I did it for three years. That's it. It was cool to meet friends, but it's a yeah. boring sport to watch, to be honest. I, if you don't know what's, yeah, if you don't know what's going on, you're like, what, you know, especially, yeah. and then the difference between what, uh, what, fr uh, freestyle, Greco, then folk, right? Yeah. Isn't there a uh, folk, folk wrestling? Yeah. Folk, um, I'm not sure. There's Greco, there's collegiate, which is, you know, the basic high school wrestling, and then, I think there is another one, but I can't remember. It might be folk. I can't remember what it is. Yeah, I think it's like funk. Funk. Yeah, this funk wrestling, baby. <laughs> funk wrestling. Um, yeah, like I, 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 I was never into wrestling. Like when I was a kid, um, my high school didn't have a wrestling team or anything like that. It wasn't until like my th like kind of like late twenties, early thirties, when I got into grappling, where uh, like Brazilian jiu jitsu, where I was like, fuck, I wish I had. I wish I had wrestled because, yeah. you know, when wrestlers come into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they have such a strong base, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and it's just, a, I mean, you know, while you almost died, <laughs> fucking losing all that weight, it's such yeah. an incredible, incredible exercise, like just, you know, exercise, um, yeah. you know, to be able to do that. Yeah. I started in my sophomore year in high school and I remember my freshman year, I was uh, in a, a PE class and the wrestling coach was the teacher and he started talking about wrestling at that time I went to a private school uh up until high school so I had there was no wrestling team or anything mm -hmm. like that I wasn't familiar and he started talking about wrestling and I actually like spoke up and I was like well wrestling isn't real oh, <laughs> and that's he's so like fun. you want to tell me what goes on in that room isn't real Oh, I'm you like, were the guy. Yeah, you were the kid who thought the WWE yeah, or WWE. Yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. Oh, so, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when did. So the first time I heard the term punching down, it was uh, with Dave Chappelle's, one of his specials a few years back. And it was about transgender people, him punching down on them. Is that like the first time that came into common parlance or had, no, I think had that been around a bit? Yeah, I think it'd been around, it, it had been around a bit. Um, uh, I, th you know, you probably, I mean, I think even in like pre, you know, social media days, there was this yeah. idea of, you know, speaking truth to power yeah. um, and not punching down. I remember, um, you know, George Carlin, of all people, uh, back in the, was, I think it was probably like the early 90s, commenting on uh, Andrew Dice Clay mm. and talking about, uh, Andrew Dice Clay's targets who are, you know, often, you know, gay and women, the ones that he's, and George Carlin used his, you know, used his, I think it was, I don't know if it was on Charlie Rose or, or um, uh, um, King, what's his name? Larry King talking about, you know, reminding, uh, 
uh, Andrew Dice Clay, that Andrew Dice Clay is Jewish, you know, so sort of like a, a marginalized group and sort of, you know, this, this idea of like punch, you know, punching down on them, which I, which I, I, I thought was, was interesting because, you know, George Carlin did punch down, you know, on people. I mean, he has a whole thing on, uh, anorexics, you know, anorexics and bulimics, rich cunt doesn't want to eat fucker, you know? So it's like, you know, they, you have people who pick and choose what, who, who's, you know, below and, and worthy of, of uh, criticism and mockery. Uh, and that changes, you know, so apparently a young, you know, a young girl, if she's, you know, young girl, uh, is she a target? No, nope, she's rich. Ah, so then, mm. then she could be a target. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think we, we've, we've heard, started hearing more of, you know, punching up and punching down because of social media and commentary in particular, you know, where it's sort of like, uh, if you're upset with Dave Chappelle, um, you might use that as a weapon against Dave Chappelle to say what he's doing is wrong because he's punching down. Um, and you know, it's just another, you know, arrow in the quiver of, uh, you know, commentary. Uh, well, and, and you have a quote about this. You say, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but it, it's basically like, I can't make fun of you because you're beneath me. Like you're mocking yeah. it. And, and it's true. Like if you, if you're saying you're punching down and a person accusing you of punching down is basically telling you that the person you're making making fun of is beneath you and like yeah. lower on the ladder or something like that. It's, and, yeah. It's extremely condescending. Yeah. You know, it's like, you're not my equal. So I can't even, I can't even talk to you right now. You know, yeah. you're, you're, you might as well be a child, you know, yeah. sorry. Uh, move on. Who, who can I, let well, I me, mean, you know, who can I go after? You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, like there's a lot of, with like wokeness, there's a lot of condescension, you know, like the whole, the idea of white privilege. It's like, me as a white person, I need to protect you as a marginalized group. And, mm -hmm. you know, you just need my protection because I'm, I'm the benevolent white person here to save you. It's, it, it's condescending, but I mean, I had one person during the BLM stuff, he was telling me how anti-racist he was. And he said he didn't call the cops on a, a black guy who mugged him because <laughs> I'm like, well, explain this to me, please. I, yeah. I really want an explanation because to me, I'm, I hear that I'm like, I don't, I don't think that comes across the way you think it does. Yeah, I, 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 I definitely know people who are just like that who've had you know similar situations where um, there's one guy who was jumped and beat up and mugged, and uh, he wasn't going to call the police because you know all cops are bastards and you know yeah. fuck that. So you know there's a there's a you know a couple of couple of things hap uh, happening there. Uh, one, to have, you know, this, uh, uh, Wilford Riley calls it this uh, prey morality, P-E-R-Y, you know, where it's sort of, uh, and this happens in particular with people in the West who are, you know, so sorry for having conquered the world and civilized the world, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, brought, uh, they're so sorry for that, that, you know, yeah, you know, do all this, you know, do all this stuff. We, you know, I deserve it. I'm a, a terrible, you know, terrible person with this, uh, uh, you know, with blood that will never wash out of my hands. Um, you know, so there's that, but then there's also just the reality of, of like, um, you know, whatever your sins are, they're yours. They're not mine. They're not other, like if you're a white person and you feel this white guilt, it's like, deal with that shit on your own. That's not, that's not other white people's, you know, issues. And when it comes to stuff like that, like someone being jumped or mugged and them not calling the police, they might think that they're doing, you know, a, a service, you know, by kind of taking on, you know, this, uh, this sacrifice, but ultimately that person's still on the street and that person will harm somebody else, you know? Yeah. So it's like you, uh, I mean, it'd be one thing if someone's like, I'm not calling the police and I'm going to find that person and enact revenge. So they never do this again. But those people don't do, don't do that. It's yeah. they, they go and they take the ass kicking and they're okay with the ass kicking. And then that person, you know, that, that criminal goes, uh, you know, goes off and, and beats the shit out of an old lady, you know, and it's just the, you know, just the, the reality of it. 
Um, yeah, uh, yeah, but I think we saw an example of that not too not too long ago, where it was like that that one kid who was walking with his uh, with his girlfriend at like three or four in the morning, and I think in Brooklyn, and then uh, you know confronted a guy who was having a moment, this black kid who was having a moment, and then the black kid came and stabbed the the guy to death, mm, and yeah. then. Oh, you know, that's the one outside of the retail store, right? Like it was maybe, a higher end retail store or something th- like this that. This is at like three or four in the morning. Mm-hmm. Like um, I, I forget where where it was exactly, but you know, the kid was a you know anti racist commie, you know, uh, and he was an example of like a lot of people you know saying like, well, you voted for this, you know, this is yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know you live and you, you lived by the social justice and you died by the social justice. Um, and then the, the girlfriend ended up just being a real piece of work. Uh, there was, there was a GoFundMe that was set up to, to, um, help her and friends of his grieve. They didn't want to, I guess they didn't want to work. So, uh, you could send money to this GoFundMe so they could, you know, have the room, uh, to grieve. Uh, and it was, that was a real thing. I, I thought it was, you know, there's so much shit that happens where you're like, this can't be real. This has to be a joke. And it turns out it's, it's real. Well, I feel like you you can always tell when uh, emotions are genuine because clearly you only ask for money when your emotions are genuine, right? Like, oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, when it comes to like COVID and stuff like that, you're in Jersey, right? Yeah, I'm in Jersey now. Yeah. I mean, you were getting ready to have your first child when COVID uh, yeah. happened. Your kid had, was born during COVID, right? Yeah. Yeah. In March of 2020. Uh, like the week, the week before he was born or the week of that he was born, there were a number of hospitals that were basically, you know, locking down to the effect that they weren't allowing husbands and partners to be in, in the hospital during delivery. Uh, so that was something my, my wife and I were really concerned about because I had, I'd been to every single doctor's visit with my wife, um, you know, every, every sonogram, uh, you know, everything. So the prospect of me not being there was just, you know, it was just awful, but I was very fortunate that, um, the hospital where she gave birth, Lenox Hill, uh, was that they, they allowed me to, to, uh, to be there, but we had, she had a friend who was at, I think one of the, what the Presbyterian hospitals and she had to have an emergency C-section and her husband wasn't allowed to be there. And it's like, for, for those of you who don't, you know, who, who've never had a baby or, you know, been in a room with a baby or know a, or know a woman who's had a baby, it is a grueling fucking process. And yeah. you can just imagine how exhausted, uh, you know, a new mom will be now add on top of that, you know, C-section, you know, they cut you open to get your kid out and what that healing process is like and how weak you are, you know. It, it, so uh it was a really sad uh sad and i i would i would say criminal um enterprise at the at the time you know doing that to people because you can never get that back i'm really fortunate i have two kids and i was able to be at at both of their births um yeah. and uh you know that's something that they'll stick with you forever you had this one part in the book where you're talking about an old lady who thinks your son's really cute and <laughs> you offer her to like you want to touch his feet because you're like social distancing something like that i thought that was hilarious oh thanks man yeah yeah it was during uh so we were yeah we were in brooklyn at the time and uh they you know had shut down the parks and stuff and uh i think they may have just reopened the park and we went to go uh, take my son for a stroll and we met this uh this elderly woman she must have been like in her 80s and she I was absolutely in love with my with my son and you know the context of it you know uh old people were dying were dropping yeah. like flies from covid and um you know here was a woman seeing you know a young a young baby it was you know a young beautiful baby and uh uh yeah part of it too she was she was reading a book i think it was called what fury uh, by mm-hmm. I think Bob Woodward yeah. about the Trump administration. Then I was thinking, man, please don't let this book be the last book she reads before she dies. <laughs> I said, let my book 
be the last book she reads before she dies. Um, but it, yeah, we had a really nice, uh, you know, nice moment with her. And, um, uh, yeah, before, you know, we headed home, I, I asked her if she wanted to, you know, hold my, my son's feet because they were, you know, cute little feet. And she went, she did, she took them, you know, in her, in her hands and, and, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was a nice, uh, whatever else I accomplished that day, I, I helped spread some joy. And so did my, my son unknowingly by just existing. That's the thing yeah. sometimes with, um, with babies uh, or people sometimes, you know, it's like them just existing just makes, uh, makes life better. You know, it's like when you walk into the street, yeah. you see someone who, if you see like a beautiful woman, you know, it's like, wow, she just, I have no idea who she is, but she just exists. And damn, isn't that, isn't that something that, uh, yeah. you know, this beautiful gal exists. Yeah. I mean, at no other time in history that I can think of in recent history would would you want to hold my baby's feet be a, a normal social interaction, but right. 2020, just everything was just insane. I, I'd imagine that was just a wealth of material during COVID for you. It, it, yeah. I mean, it was, I guess it was a wealth of material and, you know, I, I was active on social media, so anybody yeah. can go and check out you know, where I was, you know, March, 2020 through, through the rest of the year and what I was, you know, coming up with, but it was also just like, just an insanely scary time, yeah, you know? Yeah. So, uh, you know, not knowing for one, not knowing like what was going to happen day to day with this, um, you know, this illness, what the, the state response was going to be. And then also what, what the response from people who you thought wouldn't, where normal people were going, were, were going to be, you know, it was just yeah. so much up in the air. Like things, things, things were pretty bad. And, and you, you wonder how much worse they could have, they could have been for sure. You know? Yeah. I'm, I was in the same boat as you, because you mentioned like you were basically paranoid about the virus at first. I was the same way. I was, I was wiping down my groceries when I got them. Yep. I was doing all this stuff that looking back, it's like, that was crazy to be doing that. But we, I mean, when I first learned about it, I first started learning about COVID in December and I'm like, here's, there's going to be a virus. Can't trust the data coming out of China. So I was telling friends about it. Like there's going to be a virus. I don't know what the lethality of it and like you should treat it as something that's going to be really serious. And mm -hmm. then the numbers started coming in and it's like, okay, this is more like more akin to the flu than, you know, anything like Ebola or anything like that. But it's funny because as everybody found out about COVID, the trust the science people trusted the science in a very specific moment of time. Mm -hmm. And it's not even the science that they trusted. It was more the, the authorities. They trusted the authorities at a certain specific time. And then it, it feels like their information never updated from that moment on. It, it, there's people that seem to still think that it was like a horribly deadly virus. They don't consider the fact that a lot of people died with COVID rather than from COVID, mm -hmm. things like that. And I don't know, it just feels like some people's, they were broken from it. Yeah. Or, or even, you know, something that, something that I've always, you know, thought was it's, it's amazing that, you know, you had people who, you know, died from it, right? And, it, you know, it, let's say you can just separate the from and with, right? So you had people who died from it, you know, for, for sure. But then you had people who got it and shook it off in a day, yeah. you know, or a day or yeah. a couple of days who didn't, didn't really affect them. And I want to know, like, well, why is it that some, it didn't affect people, you know, some people? I've never gotten it. I yeah. still haven't gotten it. Hmm. Me, my wife, we haven't gotten it. Fortunately, my parents have, um, my parents haven't gotten it. Um, and we had, you know, early in the early days, we had been tested for it. Um, I was shooting, uh, stuff in 2021 and we, you know, had like a, a COVID officer and we were doing, you know, people were, you know, doing tests like the day before and all that, you know, just, you know, sticking to like that, that protocol. So, uh, I never had it. And it's like, now either I'm really lucky, you know, and I've never had it or, Maybe I've had it and it brushed off like it was absolutely nothing. And yeah. if that's the case, like it might be helpful to know, like, hey, why is it that some people 
uh, you know, beat this thing without even really putting up a fight while other people were just fucked from the, from the beginning. I have a friend yeah. of mine, her friend, uh, uh, one of her collaborators, uh, a musician, I think he was in like maybe his late forties, like maybe he was 50, like I like get the, the eldest and he died, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I think this, this person, at least as far as I know, was an otherwise, you know, healthy person, but you know, what was it about, you know, yeah. about that, that person's, um, anatomy or, you know, what they had going on. So, but like even asking that question was, it, it was deemed like, like almost like, like, how dare you even ask, you know, even ask that question. I remember when the, um, vaccine passport thing was, go, you know, was going around and it was like, uh, uh, so, so if I have this passport that says that I've been vaccinated, right. I can go into this you know, I can go into this restaurant, even if I have COVID, right? Yeah. Meanwhile, if I don't have COVID, but I don't have this vaccine, this passport, I can't go into this restaurant. Doesn't that doesn't make any any sense? Uh, one of the lines that I keep, you know, that I kept going back to, you know, through it is like, you know, uh, you can't spread it if you don't have it. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, and it was almost like, like even that was just a, rea you know, just an obvious, uh, an obvious observation that, you know, a lot of the follow the science people weren't even admitting, you know, don't treat everybody like they have COVID because not everybody has COVID, you know, yeah. and there's nothing to worry about if I don't have it, you know, so what the fuck are you talking about? Why, why are you being an asshole? Yeah. I mean, I'd see, I wasn't doing the podcast or anything at the time, but I would see friends or acquaintances and they would be pissed at each other for not wearing a mask or whatever mm -hmm. it might be no consideration for did you have the virus and you weren't wearing right. a mask it just did you not wear a mask you put my right. you put my mother at risk if you didn't wear a mask and it's but i didn't i wasn't carrying anything so yeah. it's the same thing whether i have a mask or not right but it's one of these things that just it i think fear does it to people where like mm -hmm they just can't function. They, they, everything is a threat. And, and obviously we have the media just pumping this fear into people constantly. And it was concerning to see how people reacted to it. And, and then the, the trust, the science stuff. I, I have so many people I know that don't know the first thing about science, but they trust the science. And it's like, how do you, it, it's it doesn't make sense and then i even i would post things like in quotes please stay six feet apart sincerely science right right and it's like people don't realize like it's just an arbitrary number there's no science that says six feet is where you you know the maximum benefit is it's just it's an arbitrary number yeah and you know and there's you know another stuff too like like uh i'm i made the joke at the time like there there are people who the only th the only quote healthy thing that they did in response to this pandemic is get a, is get the shot. Yeah. You know, like there are people who didn't change up their lifestyle, yeah. you know, like you hear like, Oh, you know, a lot of the people who are, you know, are dying. They're, they're obese. Might be a good idea to lose some fucking weight. Yeah. Then you have people who don't, you know, it's like, no, I'm, I'm, I got, I got the shot. I'm, I'm, I'm healthy. As opposed to like looking at this and saying like, man, I might have to change up my lifestyle. Like I want to be, you know, I want to be in as, as best shape as possible to, you know, to, to confront this virus or a future virus that, you know, might, might happen to come, uh, to come my way. And then, yeah. And, and for, for me, I, I, what really, um, what was really eye opening was just the utter, just like dehumanization that, that I think took place. The, 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 the people who were wishing for those who weren't vaccinated to die you know, if you weren't vaccinated, you, you know, should be, uh, you shouldn't be allowed to get life-saving surgery. You shouldn't be allowed in the hospital. You should go to your home and die. And I was somebody who, you know, I'm sorry, my libertarian, uh, brothers and sisters, but I, I, I got the first, I got the first one. I got the, the Pfizer one. And, um, I hope you're not, I hope you're not wishing for me to succumb to this fucking, <laughs> to, to, to get hurt by this fire. I've been pretty good so far. Uh, so I'm hoping that, you know, um, that, you know, everything is in its, uh, everything stays in order. Um, but you know, when I got, when I got it, I, you know, I, I was, I guess, trusting, you know, the authorities and stuff. And I was worried. I didn't want to, 
give it to if I got it, I didn't want to give it to my baby. I didn't yeah. want to give it to my wife or my my my, my elder parents uh, who had comorbidities, etc. Um, but at no point did I ever wish ill will on somebody who didn't get it. You know, if anything, I was like, thank God they're not sick. It's fucking awesome. Great. Another yeah. person survives. Amazing. This is awesome. Uh, but there are people, man, they, yeah, they really showed who they are. Um, and, um, and yeah, it was, uh, uh, it was something. And, you know, or, you know, something that, that we've seen over the past, you know, few years, this, you know, looking down on people who quote, you know, do their own research, you know, um, and it's like, you know, you have people walking around right now with hundreds of thousand dollars of student loan debt yeah. who are incapable of doing their own research. Yeah. <laughs> what the, what does that say yeah. about this state, you know, the state of humanity? Um, so. Yeah. Well, and I, I hear people say, well, you didn't do your research. You just watched a video or something like that. And it's like, well, most of the people making that comment didn't do any research either. They just right. listened to some figurehead saying, yeah. this is what you do now. Like, and I know people who are praising Fauci as like this godsend that was giving us all the the real information. And it's like, looking back, that's kind of an insane take to think that Fauci was this arbiter of truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, at one point he said uh, something like, he basically equated himself with science. Like, if you don't trust me, you don't trust science. And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I, anyone who's understood like the basics of science would see through that. But he's pretty are, old. Have, he, you know, I, yeah. I think people forget, like, he's like 80 something. Yeah. And he seems like he's going to live forever. Yeah. So, you know, whatever he's taking, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, whatever, uh, whatever fucking. Uh, bat experiments they've been doing, you know, to keep <laughs> this fucker alive. Um, so <laughs> yeah. Give me some of that. Well, the right probably thinks it's adrenochrome. Yeah. What is that? What is it? I, 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 I hear that a lot, but I'm, I'm a, I don't, was that, did they give that to Trump when he got his? So, okay. Adrenochrome. I don't even know if it's a real thing or not. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> like if it's a real substance, I think it might be a real substance, but like the conspiracy theory, stuff about it is like the elites in Hollywood are like scaring children to extract adrenochrome because mm -hmm. it's produced when you're afraid or something like that. And then all the Hollywood elites consume this stuff to stay young and healthy looking. But wait, wait, it's extracted when you're afraid? Supposedly, yeah. So, so what do they do? Like, do they like get, get, get like a haunted house or something and, <laughs> and, and have like something? <laughs> Have you like an IV drip and just scare the shit out of you? Wow. So, I mean, the conspiracy theorists are, I mean, this is like uh, QAnon kind of stuff that we're uh -huh. talking about here. Like it, it's, it's extreme. It, it's everyone in Hollywood is a pedophile, which there are pedophiles in Hollywood. Don't sure. get me wrong, but it, it's taking things to an extreme and, and Trump's still president and all this kind of stuff, you know? Mm. Yeah. Which, He's just wow. letting Biden pretend to be for four years and then he's coming back. So amazing. Yeah, it that's is. A long, that's playing the long game. That's, <laughs> yeah, right. That's some 8D chess. Yeah, 8D chess. chess. Is really that's one of my favorite things to hear about uh, Trump is the 40 chess stuff. 40 like, chess. Anything man. he does is just, it's 40 chess. Yeah, yeah. Like if he does something wrong, it's just 40 chess. You just <laughs> don't understand it. Our, our small brains cannot understand the depths of his genius to do everything. And when he's making a mistake, it's, it's just 40 chess, man. Yeah. It's like, I, I know, I know we are, you know, um, pattern seeking, uh, creatures and also, you know, looking for justifications yeah. any, anywhere we can, but yeah, some, some, sometimes it'll take you a little too far. Yeah. Well, we used to live in a time where, you know, for presidential elections, you try to get your guy elected or your person elected and if you win, great. You're happy for four years, possibly eight years. And if you lose, you you just hate the person that uh, got elected and you blame him for everything wrong. But now, I mean, Trump kind of changed that to where if your guy doesn't get elected or if the wrong guy gets elected, it's an existential threat mm -hmm. to the whole world. Like he, he's going to destroy the world. Like I feel like Trump, like COVID, is another thing that 
he broke people's brains. Like yeah. on both sides, but a lot of people who are anti-Trump, they're and it's same thing too, like that wishing horrible things on people that just don't see eye to eye with you. Like COVID, it's if you don't wear a mask or don't get the vaccine, I want you to die. And then with Trump, if if you voted for Trump, I also want you to die because you're the problem. I saw a guy uh you know recently on on X, I don't know if it was a guy or like an organization or something like that, saying like uh, you know, Republicans believe that the economy was better under Trump. Like, uh, do they really think Americans are this stupid? And it's like, well, well, buddy, you believe that Republicans are that stupid. So you believe that 50% of the country is stupid, you know? So it, it, it's a, it, you know, it, it's, it's one of these things where it's like, you know, the other side or half or half of America are uh, just, you know, they're either deplorable or too stupid to have any say, but also we really need them to have a vote. You know, we yeah. re- democracy is still the... Um, is still, you know, uh, st- still the all, you know, the the all important uh, thing to uh, to preserve. Um, and if anything, anything, like something I've just noticed over, I don't know, God, that past how, how many years? Like, you know, every four years, like you say, like when so much is at stake, it's like it's a real problem when so much is dependent upon who the president is. Yeah. You know, like you, you know, one would think if you know, I mean, we're you know libertarians. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna. Right? Are we libertarians? What are you? What are I, you I would say I'm more libertarian than anything else. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you would think that, you know, like even people who are more, you know, constitutionalists, like things would be set up or adhered to where it really shouldn't matter that much who the president is every four years because you have all these checks and balances and, you know, uh, and, and whatnot. But yeah, I think that's a real, that's a real problem, you know, yeah. that we have. Well, um, some people are, I guess Trump made some comments about wanting to be dictator for a day and and mm. people on the left are freaking out about that. And I'm like, we have checks and balances in place. If the guy was going to be a dictator, he would never have left the White House. He would have like forced himself into the White House. And then they might say, well, he tried to, yeah. but he controlled the army at that time and he could have done something. I mean, maybe they would have not gone along with it. But he could have done things that would have been more dictatorial. But I just, I think that we'll be fine regardless of who's president for the most part. You know, like things might go in a worse direction depending on who's president. But I don't think we're, you know, the president is the end all be all and we're doomed depending on who's president. Well, you know what I, what I find interesting is, um, you know, you kind of have to remind people that there was a failed assassination attempt, Yeah. you know, a failed assassination of, of Donald Trump, which, um, you know, had it been successful, I think it would have, it would have just launched our country on just a terrible, terrible yeah. road. Like yeah, I agree. either outright civil war, uh, at, you know, at the, at the worst and God knows what, you know, what that, what that entails. I mean, we see what, what happens in, you know, civil wars around the country or what happened in our own history, you know, what the yeah. body count was like. Uh, so that was, you know, at worst or at the very least, there would have been, I think a lot of dead politicians, you know, yeah. I think this would have been, I think a lot of, you know, people, Trump, you know, Trump supporters, um, uh, would have seen this as a, as a, a call of, of war and they would have, you know, enacted retribution on, on Democrats around, you know, around the country. And, and, you know, as much as, you know, I have, you know, I might have, you know, political enemies, you know, I, I, I don't want to see, you know, blood in the streets. Um, you know, it's a war that I don't, I don't want to fight and I don't want to, yeah. you know, to, to, to be involved in them. You know, I, to give Trump, you know, credit, I mean, his response afterwards, you know, I, we have the, the, the initial response of which incredible picture of, of, you know, image of him saying fight, 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 you know? Um, but, you know, to his credit, he didn't call for any, you know, bloodshed after that, you yeah. know? And I think he could have, you know, uh, he could have come out and said, they wanted me dead, you know? Yeah. And by they, he could have, you know, 
run down the list of the people of, you know, his political enemies that wanted to be dead. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I'll give him some credit on, you know, for that. It could have went a really bad way. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. And it's something that doesn't align with the, the view that a lot of people have of him as this person who's a violent, constantly trying to hurt people and putting people in danger. Like if, I mean, there's politicians who say if, if there's a tragedy, capitalize on the tragedy for political gain. Like, and, and you see it all the time. Like if, mm-hmm. if something happens and they can politicize it, they do. And if ever there was a moment that Trump could have used to enact violence against his political enemies, that was it. Like he could have said, they're trying to kill us. This is it. Like this is war now. And like he could have used that kind of rhetoric and he didn't. So I, I agree with that. I think he should have some props for that. Yeah. But it, it is interesting to see how many people, when it comes to these divisive things in our current climate, are are willing to demonize other people, dehumanize, and want to actually see violence happen to other people. And mm-hmm. it to me, it, it's a matter of people who haven't thought this through deep enough. Because I've always looked at it, I don't care who's president, I want the norms respected. I don't want... You know, I don't want people changing the rules to, you know, improve their team's odds of Mm -hmm. winning or keeping power or anything like that. But I think with the current climate, I think people are okay with that. And it, that's where I tend to disagree with people. Like I want, I want us to be respectful regardless of who's in power. And I want us to treat each other as human beings. Yeah. Something I've been seeing over the you know, past uh, few days is, uh, you know, stuff coming out of Europe and Great Britain, uh, where, you know, making arrests for, uh, basically, you know, on, on the grounds of like hate speech and yeah. misinformation and I guess incitement, uh, and, you know, the incite incitement charges, uh, uh, you know, that, that's something I think, you know, one can, uh, you know, quibble over, you know, like what constitutes incitement. And thankfully in the United States, we have you know, a very uh, high bar that you need to reach, you know, to, to be convicted of, uh, of incitement. Um, but I've been seeing like, you know, apparently they're trying to sue uh, Elon Musk and JK Rowling for their comments on the, um, uh, the one Algerian boxer mm. who I think uh, has XY chromosomes. At least that's what I've been hearing. Uh, f- and, so the idea, like, you know, they're they're looking to sue Elon Musk and J.K. Rowling into oblivion, um, you know, to punish them for for their speech and what they're what they're putting out there. And you know, I expect a lot of Europeans to be applauding this because you know they don't know they don't believe in free speech, they don't believe in self defense, they don't believe in liberty. But to see like my fellow countrymen in the United States, you know, getting on there and retweeting and saying, "Yeah, take them for everything they got." I'm like, man, you motherfuckers, man. Like, damn, it's so difficult sharing. It's so difficult to share a country with people who one don't, you know, don't share your values, but also will not uphold the, you know, the rule of law, I guess, you know, that protect those values. So um, it's kind of, it's been disconcerting past few days. I I mean, it, I grew up, it it wasn't until later in life where I was like, oh, we're not all on the same page. I didn't, I didn't realize that growing up. Mm-hmm. There's some things that I learned and I just took for granted. Like I, I don't agree with you, what you say, but I, res- I, I'll defend to death your right to say it. Like I took that as, like that's America. Like we don't have to respect what each other say, but we all have the right to speak our minds. And and now it's, it has just changed a lot, and it, it is very concerning to see people not value that or value it um, selectively, like. Free speech is great if it's people I agree with right. saying things, but if it's people I don't agree with, speak free speech is just hate speech, and it, it's just unfortunate that that's where we're at. Mm-hmm. So, how do you feel comedy can cure this? Like, not cure because it's not like comedy is just this thing that has to fix everything, but. Do you feel like people could benefit from embracing comedy? Like, I feel like we've gone away from that as a society. Like comedy is, 
it's just not quite what it used to be, not as uniting as it used to be. I think it can be, but mm-hmm. it seems like now, oh, I have to go to comedians that align politically with me and all that nonsense. Well, well even with that, I mean, if, if, you know, if, if someone just wants to, you know, check out, you know, like you said, the like comics who they agree with politically, I, that that's fine as long as they're not trying to, you know, take down comedians who they don't agree with, you know, and yeah. try to make it so that they don't, they don't work again. Um, uh, yeah, I think that, I think comedy is important, you know, beyond the whole, like, you know, speaking truth to power and holding up a mirror to society and blah, 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 you know, uh, I think it's just important to laugh, you yeah. know? Um, and I've been on, I don't know if you've ever been in like a restaurant and looked over at a, you know, a date that was happening at another table and, and nobody's laughing. It's like, Jesus Christ, that's fucking miserable, isn't it? You know, yeah. especially with like a smile, you know, no smiles, no laughter. Um, so I think that, you know, even just as a real, you know, just as a, you know, there's something really elemental to, uh, uh, to comedy that, that is so, so necessary and, and important. Yeah. And just laughing with a group of people. I mean, we're in the Netflix era now where people right. just watch comedy at home mm-hmm. probably more often than ever before, which is fine. I, I, I enjoy watching comedy at home, but there's something about going to a comedy club or a show where everyone's laughing together. And it, you know, it, it's like a sport event where it's like, you feel that energy and like, mm-hmm. Maybe you laugh a little harder than you would have by yourself, or maybe you laugh at something that you you might not have had much of a reaction. You might have chuckled a little bit by yourself, but I feel like that atmosphere has a lot of positive energy to it. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I think uh, some of the hardest that I ever laughed, you know, other than uh, like I said, the last time was was Scott Thompson show King. Um, but I remember seeing, I think it was like Jackass, I don't know, it was Jackass 3D, um, seeing that in a movie theater and just fucking howling. Like yeah. that was, oh my God. And that I, I, I laugh really hard, even just watching it on, you know, from watching it just like on, on my, you know, on like the equivalent of Netflix or, or whatever. But um, yeah, there's something really great about being in a room and making it happen in real time, you know? Yeah. Well, Lou, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. I love to ask people I interview about books that they enjoy and books that have meant a lot to them. I see a whole bunch of books behind you. So mm-hmm. I'm wondering if, um, hopefully they're not just your wives. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> this is I'd my to... <laughs> office. I don't allow any chick books in here, man. Well, I, I would love to hear what books, uh, I mean, you would recommend to people what books have influenced you a lot in your life. Oh, yeah. Um, man, what do I got? Um it's been so, it, it, I'm, I'm really, I hate to say this, but it's been so long since I've like read a book mm. cover to, you know, uh, cover to cover, but I, technically I do read a lot because I'm yeah. always reading like articles and stuff. It's always like on my screen, but like reading like a physical, um, a physical book. Um, and I know I can mess up right now and say like a terrible, uh, you know, make a terrible recommendation. One thing, let me, let me just, uh, I'm going to go again. There's, um, there's actually a book. Uh, that I have a short story in. It's called Nothing Sacred. Hmm. And it's, uh, uh, what is this? Outspoken Voices in Contemporary Fiction. So I have a book in there. I have a short story in there. And it's actually like literary fiction too. If hmm. that, if, if my comedy doesn't turn you on, maybe my, my, my fiction will. Uh, so yeah, if, if you guys want to go find that, that, that'd be awesome. It's with, um, uh, it's published by Heresy Press. I'm sorry, it's really dirty. I was drinking coffee out of it. Um, and uh, so, so I'd recommend that. And then, yeah, if you're looking to read like a novel, something, what's a novel that I, I would say? Um, do, do, do. Um, if I can go back, I would, I would reread uh, T.C. Boyle has a, has a novel called Drop City hmm. that is excellent. And I read that God, probably like over 10 years ago. Uh, and it's about a bunch of hippies in California who have been kind of squatting on some land and they get kicked off and they want to like drop out, you know, of society. And, uh, so they decide, uh, 
they decide to do it in like Alaska in like the, you know, the, I don't know if it's in exactly the tundra, but just imagine a bunch of hippies from California going up to Alaska to sort of start a commune and drop out of, of society and see how things, uh, things go. Uh, so I read that a while ago and, um, yeah, he's, uh, DC Boyle is pretty, uh, incredible writer. He, there are some people who, they, they just come up with these sentences that, you know, it's just like, how, how is that even, how is that possible? So. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That sounds like a really interesting book. Um, yeah, before we wrap up, obviously I hope listeners go and buy your book. Yes. I think it's a great book. I think it touches on a lot of important topics with a lot of humor in it too, which I've, I don't read a lot of comedy. The only comedy book I've, I've probably read a few, but, uh, George Carlin, one of his books I read one time, and I thought it was good. I actually think this was better. Like, George Carlin's book was... His comedy is different because he's not, like, humor, humor. He's kind of, like... There's some rants. Humor. Some rants yeah. happening there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, his uh, comedy is interesting. But, yeah, before we wrap up, I want to offer you the mic to share with listeners how they can find your book, how they can find out more about your comedy, uh, more about your writing, anything else you want to offer yeah well well thank uh thanks again Artie. yeah please uh, check out my book uh that joke isn't funny anymore there's there's the big cover of it right there and um i'm, I'm actually on substack now uh the lou perez on substack so uh you know if you guys would like to support my work you could uh you could join and be a, a paying member awesome well lou it's been a pleasure talking to you today and uh yeah i hope to do it again sometime likewise all right man Thank you. Got it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab, where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media on x at rdtm podcast and Instagram at thoughtfully mindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.